All right, this week I'm going to introduce the second unit, Paradise Lost by John Milton. Uh, right, John Milton lived in the 17th century. He, um, even though he's usually studied in a later period from Shakespeare, he was born, in fact, very near Shakespeare's time. So, in fact, you can think of them as uh, almost from the same period. I'll talk about Milton first, and then I'll talk about Paradise Lost. And then if we still have time, I will guide you through reading the first few pages. So, John Milton. Milton is a very strange guy. Uh, he's considered very progressive for his time. So, for example, he championed the right of divorce if husband and wife were not a good match. He championed the right of freedom of publication, despite the fact that there was no real democracy at the time. From a young age, Milton set a goal for himself. He wanted to be a great English poet. Now, not many people set out in life wanting to be great English poets, but he's not the only one. Uh, there were a no, a one or two people before him in English literature who had that goal and succeeded. There were probably even more people who did not succeed, and so we don't know about them. So uh, when he was before 20 years old, Milton was already famous for his lyric poetry, shorter poems. He mastered older forms of poetry, uh, and he set his sights on doing something big. Then in 1642, the English Civil War started. The English Civil War is fought between the armies of the king and the armies of the parliament, Guohui. The idea is the king is supposed to uh, discuss major policies with the parliament, especially related to taxes and wars. At the time, parliament was not always directly elected. Parliament sometimes was chosen from local nobles. Uh, so this war is not exactly a war between monarchy and democracy. It's more like a war between one ruler and like 400 rulers. Uh, but there's not a direct connection with what the people wanted. Anyway, at the time, King Charles the, I believe King Charles the, the first, did not like parliament. His own father, King James the first, also did not like parliament. It's a family tradition. Um, so over time, Charles uh, ignored parliament more and more until uh, in, I believe, 1640, parliament convened itself. They didn't wait for the king to call a meeting, they met themselves and they set out new laws. And of course, the king didn't want to execute these laws. Uh, and the parliament met and they did not dissolve. Usually uh, when the parliament meets, they have a set time limit. And after a certain period, everybody goes home and the next parliament, they choose new members. But this parliament didn't go home. They would stay there until King Charles followed the laws or at least negotiated with them. Um, but Charles did not. Uh, and because Parliament kept waiting, this Parliament is called the Long Parliament. Uh, they waited until 1642 and they couldn't wait anymore. So uh, using the authority of Parliament, not the King, Parliament, they raised an army and they tried to force the king to negotiate with them, and that is the English Civil War. So one side supported the king. They are called the Royalists or the Loyalists uh, or uh, the, the Roundheads, Ren Lu Dang, if you remember from high school world history. The other side supported parliament, and they were called the Tories. Uh, and Later on, they turned into what today in England is known as the Conservative Party, Bao Um, And in the early days of the Civil War, Parliament was winning. They raised a stronger army. They had a better general. Uh, the general they found was 
Oliver Cromwell, Cullen Weir, uh, who was such a good fighter, uh, such a good general in the war that he later, Parliament later gave him the title of Lord Protectorate, Hu Guo Gong. Uh, and so wherever uh, Cromwell fought, the king lost. So first Cromwell beat the king in England, and then the king went to Scotland. So Cromwell went to Scotland and beat the king there, and then the king ran to Ireland. And so Cromwell went to Ireland and beat the king there, and then the king ran away to Europe. Now, Cromwell was going to follow him to Europe, but the thing about Cromwell, he is an excellent general, but a terrible politician. So yes, he won all the fights against the king, but his own enemies in parliament slowly grew stronger. And they were thinking, we're fighting the king so that parliament can be in charge. But if we keep on supporting Cromwell, wouldn't he just become the new king? And so in fact, the more that Cromwell won, the more enemies he had at home. Uh, and so in 1658, uh, he died of natural causes, not in the war. He wasn't assassinated. He got sick and died. His son uh, was designated as his successor, and that's when Parliament really thought, no, we can't do this. We just we want to kick out the king. We don't want to have a new king. So uh, in 16 between 1658 and 1660, Parliament was fighting against uh, itself. They weren't supporting the designated leader, and so King Charles gathered a new army, including supporters from Europe. Because, of course, at that time, Europe was full of kings. Nobody on Europe wanted to see England ruled by Parliament and not the king. So King Charles gathered a new army and allies in Europe, and he uh, fought back uh, and defeated the parliamentary army and won the war in 1660. Now, wh what does this have to do with Milton? Milton also thought that King Charles was out of bounds and that it would be better for Parliament to have control. So he sided with Parliament in the Civil War. A at the beginning, this is a good thing, right? Because Cromwell kept winning. And so you have Milton writing propaganda poems supporting Oliver Cromwell, uh, and he became really famous for these. But then as the tide started turning and Parliament started losing, uh, Milton's friends started thinking, wait, what if we lose? Maybe I should hide. Maybe I should stop writing. Uh, and so one by one, his friends ran away or stopped writing or in fact changed sides and uh, started supporting the king until it was just Milton left. Um, and the only reason Milton wasn't killed after 1660 is because he had went blind from illness. Again, not because somebody stabbed his eyes, right? He got sick, he lost his eyesight. Uh, and so the, the, the king was thinking, you know, he's a blind poet. What, what harm can he do? And so this is the situation of Milton as he was writing Paradise Lost. He started writing around the time that the, the parliament started losing the Civil War. Um, Milton, as I mentioned, his great ambition was to be one of the greatest English poets. And to be a great poet, you need to write a great work. And in poetry, the greatest work is an epic. So if you think back to your introduction to Western literature course, you studied two epics by Homer right? The Iliad and the Odyssey. Even today, they are considered some of the best literature in the Western world. That is the kind of ambition that Milton had. So when he started thinking about how to write an epic and what he should write about, um, at that point, the epic tradition usually wrote about the beginning of a country. So after Homer, you had um, Virgil, Wagier, and he wrote the Aeneid, which is the about the founding of Rome. And then uh, later you had Tasso, well not later, after Milton, 
uh, in the 19th, 18th, 19th centuries, you had Tasso who wrote about the founding of Italy. So this is the epic tradition. You write about how your own country began. The problem for Milton is, it's kind of ironic, there was too much English history. All, a lot of history was already written down. And, you know, if you think about epic poetry, right, think about Homer. It's not just humans, right? There are gods, there are monsters. And so, in fact, for Milton, there was too much written history and not enough space to add these legendary elements or these fantastical elements. And he had a hard time thinking about how to turn this ordinary history into something grand and epic and legendary. He tried, he gave up, he tried again, he gave up. And then he realized, you know, maybe I don't have to write about my nation. Maybe I can write about all nations. Maybe I can write about the beginning of human history. And for him, at that period, the beginning of human history was the Bible. And at the beginning of the Bible, you have the book of Genesis, Chuangsiji, which tells the story of how God created the world, created humans, and how humans created original sin and uh, were um, exiled from paradise and ended up beginning what we think of as human history, pain, suffering, consequences, and always, always, always trying to be better. With the help of God, of course. And so this is the story that Milton decided to tell. Now, have you read the book of Genesis before? Some of you have. You will know that the story of Adam and Eve takes about three pages. The poem that Milton ended up writing, Paradise Lost, is 11,000 lines. About this story. So you can imagine he added some things. Um, and it's fascinating to think about what he added. Not just Adam and Eve. But all, going back to why uh, Satan corrupted Eve. Why did Satan give Eve the forbidden fruit? And so he act, the story that Milton tells, actually, uh, if you put it in the correct order, it begins when Satan rebels against God in heaven. And at the end, it ends with Jesus Christ coming back to save all of humanity. So in terms of the Christian worldview, it is literally all of human history. All the important start, uh, all the important parts. But because it is an epic poem, you can't tell it in order. Again, going back to Homer, both the Iliad and the Odyssey start in the middle of things. In Latin, in medius res. Think of the Iliad. The Trojan War was 10 years, but the Iliad begins in the ninth year. Think of the Odyssey. Odysseus spent 10 years getting home. The poem began in the ninth year. So where does Paradise Lost begin? It begins with Satan being thrown into hell. He has just lost the battle. And then uh, the regular order of the poem is we follow Satan as he thinks about how to plan revenge. He comes up with the idea. Uh, he goes to seduce Eve and Eve eats the forbidden fruit. They get kicked out of paradise, but uh, prophecy tells them that Jesus will come down and save their children. That's the regular order. And then all of the flashbacks deal with Satan's war in heaven uh, and like how God thought about these events uh, and how God planned to send Jesus later to save humankind. Now, that's a lot of stuff. But Milton can't just tell the story. He's not writing popular fiction. He's writing an epic. And an epic needs epic language. Homer used a combination of Greek from many different periods. 
OK, so maybe Homer did not exist. Maybe that's just the name that ancient historians gave the so-called author of the Iliad and the Odyssey. Maybe these poems were recorded and put together from stories at different uh, levels of the past. And so the language sometimes is closer to uh, uh, more recent Greek. Sometimes it's really old Greek and it's just combined together. The Bible is also like this. So uh, much of the Old Testament is written in Hebrew, not all of it, a lot of it. And much of the New Testament is written in Aramaic, which is a language related to Greek. Again, not all of it, most of it, but different parts use different languages. So language is an important part of an epic. Milton, because he wanted to be a great English poet, wrote in English. But because he wanted to be a great English poet, he wrote in older English that looks like Latin. Now, a lot of the words are not harder than uh, the words that we saw in the play, Tis Pity She's a Whore. But the sentence structure can be a little confusing. And this is because uh, people usually think that the best Latin is so-called Ciceronian Latin. Cicero was a famous statesman and orator in the Roman period, and his Latin is famous for putting the verb at the very end. So in English, we go subject, verb, object. Cicero went subject, object, verb, or sometimes object, subject, verb. And if there's even if the sentence is even more complicated, you would have like relative clauses, you would have uh, ablative clauses, you would finish all of that and then finally get to the verb. So this can be a little confusing if the sentence gets longer and you don't quite remember what the verb is supposed to be connected to. Um, so that's something that we have to pay attention to when we read. Oh, and the reason Latin can do this is because there is no standard word order in Latin. And this is because every word in Latin has two functions. One is the meaning of the word and two is the grammar of the word. And so each word tells you what part of the sentence it is. So in Latin, when you move a word to a different part of the sentence, you can still look at that word and know which part of the sentence it is. So like in Latin, the same word will look different if it is the subject, if it is the object, if it is the indirect object, if it is the genitive, soilga, if it is the ablative, which is what you put after a preposition. Uh, or the other kinds of words. Every form of the word looks different. So if you know all of the forms, you don't have to know the sentence order. You can put it together in using logic. And so uh, Latin uses many different kinds of sentence orders. But by the time of Milton, the, the uh, I guess, most famous, the most beautiful, Sentence order was the order of Cicero, putting the verb at the very end. Thank God, right? Because can you imagine if Milton used random sentence orders? It would be crazy. It would be crazy interesting to read. Um, so a bit about the publication history. Milton finished the first edition of Paradise Lost in 1662. He was blind. So he had an amanuensis, which is a person who helps write down what a blind person uh, wants to write. Um, so basically Milton would think the poem in his head, he would recite it, and his amanuensis would write it down, and then the amanuensis would repeat it back to him, and he would tell, I think it was her, uh, which parts to change. So, you know, it was not a fast process. He didn't have a computer. So it took a while, but he finished the first edition in 62, sent it to the publisher. It was a pretty big hit. 
at the time it was it, it wasn't a bestseller but it was recognized as an important contribution to english literature but then his publisher said mr milton you've written such a long poem and it's so great but the language sometimes makes it hard to understand so not for us it's also for them right even at that time it was not exactly easy to understand so his printer said what if you added like a summary be before each book and that way the reader can understand what you're trying to say and milton said you know what that's a good idea i'll do that so uh, he spent uh 10 more years 12 years and in 1674 he he put out the second edition and before each book, there is now something called an argument. If you look at your handout, page one is the editor's introduction, but page two, starting from page two, is Milton's original argument for each book. And the argument is just a summary. Um, the first edition of Paradise Lost was divided into 10 books, but Milton took this opportunity and reorganized the whole poem into 12 books. Uh, and he made a few minor changes also, but nothing uh, big. So usually people read the second edition of Paradise Lost, and that is the one that we're going to read. The arguments are written in, let's call it regular English, not Latin English, but it is still the English of Milton's day. So it's not exactly uh, as easy as a summary from Wikipedia. Now, we're not going to read 11,000 lines. We're not even going to read 1,000 lines. We're going to read 500 lines. It's 5% of the poem. Um, and if you look at the handout, so page one is the modern editor's introduction. Starting from page two is Milton's arguments. One argument per book. There are 12 books. So it takes a few pages. And then uh, starting on page six is the beginning of the poem. Now, at the very beginning, Milton added a short preface here he defends the use of his poetry so at the time okay milton uses blank verse the same as the play that we read tis pity she's a whore but at the time blank verse was considered a low kind of poetry precisely because it was used by plays if you remember the play it was very soap opera it was very like a, like a pulp fiction very hollywood movie kind of play it was not considered high culture and so here milton defends his choice to use blank verse unrhymed iambic pentameter uh, and uh, if you're interested you can read his defense um, but we're not going to focus on that and then page seven is book one. But you'll notice that this is not line one, right? This is line 91. Um, I only printed the parts that I want you to read. And so let's see, starting on page seven, it's 42 pages, 42 minus seven, 35 plus one. It's 36 pages in three weeks. So that's like around 12 pages per week. Uh, again, it's it's not that much. Um, so we're going to jump around, not jump around. We're going to read selections from uh, each book. We're going to skip some of the boring books. Um, we're gonna, I picked some of the more famous and more interesting parts of the poem for us to read together. Um, as I said, the first book begins with Satan having been thrown down into hell and he wakes up in hell and he notices his fellow devils around him. And 
uh, they start thinking about what just happened and they start planning how to take revenge, that kind of thing. One thing about this beginning is that it makes Satan look like the protagonist. Right, if you think about the Iliad, it begins with Achilles. If you think about the Odyssey, it begins with Odysseus. So when Paradise Lost begins with Satan, it makes it look like the poem is about Satan. And this has some interesting effects. Satan is also known as the great deceiver. He's silver tongued. He has great powers of persuasion. So when we read his words. They can seem kind of convincing. It seems like Satan. It feels like Satan kind of makes sense. Maybe he was wronged by God. Maybe he is suffering. Maybe he does deserve to take revenge. And we'll take a closer look at that. Uh, in next week's selection. Um, OK, so that is the basic introduction. I am now going to show you how to use the handout. But before that, do you have questions? All right, so let's take a look at this handout. Um, in the interest of saving space, I have combined different pages together. So if you see, um, let's see, this is page eight. If you see a break like this, this means that some lines have been skipped, right? So this is 175, this is 210. So this blank line is skipping some lines. When we reach a new book, uh, it will say the name of the book on the right. So page nine is now book two. Some of these selections are being spoken by a character. And if the selection doesn't tell you which character, I have added the name of the character for you. So this at the beginning of book two, we are listening to Beelzebub talking. Beelzebub is one of the more important devils. Um, OK, so that's the structure of the handout. And then let's look at the editorial matter. So at the bottom of each page, you have footnotes. These footnotes uh, do two things. Either they add information. Or sometimes when the sentence is especially confusing, the editor will translate the sentence for you in the footnotes. But if the sentence structure is fine, but the word is confusing. The editor has added notes on the right hand side. So if you look at page seven, um, in line 93, thunder, and then you see this little circle. This circle means that there is a note on the right. So thunder here means thunderbolt, lay p. Right, so it's like a direct translation. And then line 104, dubious. Dubious today means not trustworthy. But Milton uses it to mean of uncertain outcome. It's a dubious battle. So it's a battle that it's not clear who would win. Uh, and so that's how the handout is designed. You know, Milton's language, right? Even the printer thought it's not easy to understand. And one reason is because uh, Milton sometimes uses words in the meaning that they used to have, not in the meaning that they had even in his day. Sometimes he invented what looked like an older meaning. Like, um, you know, English is a changing language, words, change their meanings over time. And so sometimes a word looks like it means this, but it actually means that. Often the way that it looks is its older meaning. 
but sometimes that is a false clue. But in Paradise Lost, Milton sometimes uses that uh, false early meaning. So, you know, even checking a historical dictionary may not help you there. So the editor has explained all of the harder words. Well, I guess all the words that the editor thinks is hard. Um, let's see if we can find an example of a footnote translation. Note eight. Uh, let's see, where is this? Ah, here we go. Page seven, line 109. And what is else not to be overcome? The footnote says this means, what else does it mean not to be overcome? Uh, in modern English, when you say not to be overcome, not to be defeated, what else could you mean? But if you look at the original sentence, and what is else not to be overcome looks like it means what else is not defeated. It looks different from what it actually means. Uh, and so in these cases, there will be a footnote. I guess in most of these cases. OK, so do you have a question about how the handout is designed, how to use the handout? Right, so we're dividing it into three weeks. Before next week, please finish up to the end of book five. Don't worry, I didn't select a lot of stuff to read. It, it's divided evenly into three parts. So let's see, where's book five? Okay, so the end of book five is on page 18. Right, so up to the end of the selection of book five. So read all the way until you get to book six and then stop. So seven to 18, that's exactly 11, uh, 12 pages, right? One third. OK, do you have other questions? So I gave you the arguments, the summaries at the beginning, so that uh, if you feel lost, if you're not sure what's going on, you can look at the argument to see what's going on in the overall poem. Right, because I didn't select the parts that are important to the story. I selected the parts that are important to literary history or cultural history. So uh, my selections may not be coherent. So if you feel lost or if you want to know what's going on, you can look at the arguments at the beginning. OK. If you don't have questions, I'll guide you starting in book seven. Uh, sorry, book book one, page seven. Uh, OK, I think this begins in the middle of a sentence. Sorry, so let's begin after the colon. Mahahomin. Into what pit thou seest, from what height fallen? So you see what hole, a pit, even today a pit means a hole, what hole uh, we have fallen into from what height? So look how far we have fallen. Look at this hole we have ended up in. So much the stronger proved he with his thunder because he, God, with his thunderbolt, turned out to be so much stronger and the the stronger means stronger than we were 
So basically, we lost the war because God was stronger because he had thunderbolts. Although if you think about it, a God with thunderbolts. This sounds very Greek. Right, isn't this the weapon of Zeus? Uh, so like even in modern English, we say it proved to be, which means it turned out to be. And till then, who knew the force of those dire arms? Uh, force means power, dire means uh, dangerous or like harmful. Arms means weapons. Even today, we use the word arm to mean weapon, right? To to arm yourself means to pick up a weapon. A firearm is a gun. Uh, in the US Constitution, uh, the Second Amendment gives citizens the right to bear arms, which means to carry weapons, which means to carry guns. Uh, so the meaning still exists. We just don't use it every day. Now, there is a point of grammar. Till then means until then. I think that part is clear, but until then means when we reach that point, things changed. So, for example, if I say I won't be available until tomorrow. Will I be available tomorrow? Yes, I'm not available today. But I will be available tomorrow, so I won't be available until tomorrow. How about this one? I didn't understand until now. Do I understand now? I do. Until after until the situation changes. Right, I won't be available until tomorrow, so I'm available tomorrow. I didn't understand until now, so I understand now. That's something that a lot of Taiwanese students uh, get wrong. So the the point in time after tomorrow is when things change. Or after the until is when things change. So till then, who knew the force of those die arms? Who knew how powerful those weapons were until that moment when we lost the war? Yet not for those, nor what the potent victor in his rage can else inflict, do I repent or change. Uh, for means because. So you can see here, right? This is a sentence that ends with the verb. The order of this sentence is. I do not repent, which means like change my mind or change because of those weapons or because of what the powerful winner can do in addition when he gets angry. So even when these things happen, I won't change my mind. Like I'm not changing my mind even though his weapons are powerful, even though he can continue to win against us, I'm still not changing my mind. Uh, so potent means powerful. We still use this word today. Inflict means cause harm. We still use this word today. So even though he's God is much more powerful, I'm still not changing my mind. Though changed in outward luster. Luster means shine. Today we use this word in geology to describe a rock. If it's shiny, we say that it has a luster. So changed in outward luster means I used to shine brightly. Now I am not so bright, right? Outwardly I have changed. Satan's proper name is Lucifer, right? Lucifer. Lucifer means bright star. He was the brightest angel, the most powerful angel. Uh, yeah, the most powerful angel. So he has lost, he's in hell, he's no longer so bright. That fixed mind and high disdain. So this is the object of the verb change. 
what does he not change? He doesn't change his mind, which is fixed, 固定的. He doesn't change his disdain, 鄙视, uh, his disdain for God. Uh, it is a high disdain, which means a strong disdain, a strong contempt. Uh, again, we still use this word today. From sense of injured merit, why does he feel this way? Because he has been offended. Merit today means like the thing that makes you deserve something good. So here, injured merit means he feels like he deserves to rule, but he lost. And so his, you can say like his pride or his ego has been injured. That with the mightiest raised me to contend. Okay, the antecedent of that is his merit. His, um, his merit raised me to contend with the mightiest. Contend means to fight against or to compete against. Uh, and the mightiest, of course, just means God. So he feels like he deserves to compete and win against God. And to the fierce contention, contention is just the noun of contend, brought along innumerable force of spirits armed that durst dislike his reign. So when he fought God, he brought along num uh, like innumerable means too many to number. So many, uh, a large force of spirits, spirits here means angels, with uh, their own weapons, armed. That dare, durst means dare, dislike God's control. Reign is what a king does. A king reigns over his country. Uh, again, we still use this word today. So he's thinking back to why he fought God and how he fought God. And me preferring the, the subject of this sentence is all of these angels. They dislike God and they preferred him, Satan. His God's utmost power with adverse power opposed. So bringing this army, uh, I opposed God's highest power with an opposite power. Power here means army. In dubious battle on the plains of heaven. Uh, so the war is not to him, to Satan. This war does not have a guaranteed outcome. And you might be thinking, so Satan didn't think he would win? Now, you got to remember, God is all powerful. He's supposed to, God is always going to win. So when Satan says dubious, he means that he thought there was a chance that God would lose. And shook his throne. Although, again, God is all powerful. So this is Satan in his own fantasy. He imagines that God was scared of him. What though the field be lost? Field means battlefield. What though uh, means uh, so what? Like we lost, okay, so what? What though the field be lost? Shuro is a young. All is not lost. Okay, grammar time. All is not lost does not mean uh, It means There's a difference, right? It means it does not mean we have kept everything. It means we have not lost everything. Uh, in English, if you negate a collective word like all or every, 
then you are not negating everything. You are negating the fact of the collection. 因为里面你否定集合名词的时候，你否定的并不是所有所属的名词，你否定的是集合本身。I'll give you a brief example. Um, I I don't know Andy and Brittany. This means, uh, that's not a good example. I don't work with Andy and Brittany. This means I may work with Andy. I may work with Brittany, but I don't work with both of them at the same time. It's negating the word and. 否定的不是两个人,否定的是那个and那个字. This is how negation works in English. So all is not lost means we did not lose everything. It does not mean we have prevented everything from being lost. If you want to negate more than one thing, you have to use or. I don't work with Andy or Brittany means I don't work with Andy, I don't work with Brittany, and when you put the two together, I still don't work with them. But I don't work with Andy and Brittany just means not both of them. And this is why it's always a good idea to pick a literature person to teach grammar. So Satan is saying, OK, we lost. So what? We didn't lose everything. The unconquerable will. Unconquerable means cannot be defeated. Will is like uh, strength of intention. So he's, he's saying the things that they did not lose. We, we still have our unconquerable will. And study of revenge. Study here means intense consideration, which means they keep on thinking about it and planning it. We still have this. Immortal hate. And courage never to submit or yield. To submit means to recognize somebody else as more powerful. Yield means to give up. So he's saying we lost the war, but we still have our intention. We still have our revenge, our hate and our courage never to give up. Very powerful stuff, right? Let's take a short break.
Okay, line 110. No, 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 109. And what is else not to be overcome? Which means, what else does it mean to not be overcome? To not be... Okay, so here's the order. And what else is to not be overcome? So when you say not be defeated, what else could you mean if not having the unconquerable will, study of revenge, immortal hate, and courage? Like, what else could you mean? This is what it means to not be defeated. That glory never shall his wrath or might extort from me. Sorry, that glory never shall his wrath or might extort from me. The word order is his wrath or might shall never extort that glory from me. Wrath means anger. Uh, extort here just means force out of me, force me to give up. So the word order you can tell is not the usual English word order, but it's still you can still make it make sense. Right, the verb extort is related to force or related to power, so you can guess that the subject is probably wrath or might. Uh, and extort from me goes together, and so the last part, that glory must be the object. To bow and sue for grace with suppliant knee. To sue for grace. Okay, usually we say to sue for peace, which means uh, to ask for peace negotiations. Uh, in Chinese, 主张和谈. Uh, but because this is God, so you don't sue for peace, you sue for grace, undin, which is like to be forgiven by God. With suppliant knee, a suppliant, sometimes called a supplicant, is somebody who begs a God for help. This is from, uh, I guess, from ancient Greece. Um, so at the same time, Satan is saying, I won't uh, submit to God and I won't ask for his mercy. I won't ask for his help. So to do this and deify his power. So if I do this, I would be admitting that he is a powerful God. Deify means to turn into a God. Dei, Dei, this beginning just means God. So usually the noun is deity, which means a God, some kind of God. So deify is to make into a God. Uh, and deify his power, who from the terror of this arm so late doubted his empire. So what about God? From the terror of this arm, here, Satan is talking about his own weapons. In fact, you can even imagine him raising his own arms and his own weapons. Late means recently. In modern English, we still use this in one place. If somebody has recently left their job. For example, if uh, just for example, if I retire, then you can say that uh, CJ was late of Ming Chuan University. So recently of. Uh, so from the terror of this, my arm so recently doubted his empire, so feared for his empire. That were low indeed. Low means unbecoming, unworthy, something that you is like I should not do. Were is the subjunctive, chi. So here he's saying, if I do that, that would be low. We still use the word were in subjunctive today, right? If I were a god, 
right? I'm not a god, but if I were a god, we use the word were. Uh, so this sentence up to this point means like. If I asked God for forgiveness on my knees and admitted his power, even though I had so recently made used my own weapons and power to make him fear for losing his empire. If I did that, it would be unworthy of me. It would be low of me. That were an ignominy and shame beneath this downfall. If I did that, it would be worse and more shameful than having been thrown into hell. Downfall here is a literal meaning, right? He has fallen down into hell. Ignominy just means it's it's a stain on his reputation. It's shameful. Since by fate, the strength of gods and this imperial substance cannot fail. Uh, OK, imperial substance. In Milton's time, people still believed that the Earth was the center of the universe. And um, so you had the Earth, you had the sky, and then you had what's called the celestial uh, spheres. They imagined that there would be levels of sky, I think nine levels, and at the high, uh, seven, uh, seven levels, at the highest level is heaven. Uh, and these levels don't move. The earth is the center of the universe, and so the stars don't move. They're always there. And so that is the imperial substance, the different layers of heaven. And those layers are considered to be eternal. So he's saying, since by fate, the strength of gods and the levels of heaven cannot, uh, they are immortal, they cannot end, right? Fail, it means cease to exist. And we also have a footnote for strength of gods. Oh, it just means gods means angels. Uh, usually, but here the editor says that Satan is actually talking about. Uh, being God or being a God. Since through experience of this great event, Finally, a, a line we can understand through experience of this great event in arms, not worse. So my weapons were not worse than God's. In foresight, much advanced. So this experience has taught us a lot. It has advanced our foresight. We may with more successful hope resolve, which means decide, to wage by force or guile eternal war irreconcilable to our grand foe. So with the advantages of having lost, we can decide with more hope to fight using force or guile. Guile means deceit, chiman. Choose to fight eternal war that cannot be negotiated. Irreconcilable. So no matter what God says, we will not negotiate. To our grand foe, God, who now triumphs, who is currently the winner. And in the excessive joy, soul reigning holds the tyranny of heaven. Uh, this is God, right? God is enjoying his victory, maybe enjoying too much, right? Excess. He is the only ruler who holds the, the tyranny of heaven. Tyranny is just control, control of heaven. So if you pay close attention, you can already see Satan using his trickery. Because look at this. He says that God's, uh, his weapons 
are not worse than gods. But earlier he just said that they lost because of God's thunderbolts. Who knew the force of those dire arms? So already Satan is using tricky language. Uh, and then you can look at this word triumphs. You do you see that that symbol above the U? You saw your EPA. This is because um, Milton, when Milton puts the word here, the accent doesn't fit the meter. So by putting the mark here, he's saying you should read this word in a different uh, stress. So, for example, um, if if you read it normally, this line says, "Who now triumphs and in the excess of joy." But if you follow the meter, it should say, "Who now triumphs and in the excess of joy." So the stress has changed. So uh, okay, line one twenty five. Uh, you'll notice that this is the end of the quotation. The quotation ended on 124. So spake the apostate angel. Uh, this is Satan. Uh, apostate means um, like betraying God, giving up on religion. Spake is the ancient form of spoke. Have you guys heard of a book called The Sp Spake Zarathustra? Okay, never mind. Uh, so spake the apostate angel, though in pain. So the narrator emphasizes no matter how glorious Satan's language sounds, he is still in pain here in hell. Vaunting aloud. Vaunting means boasting, speaking big, Shuo But racked with deep despair, racked means suffering. Or I say racked with means suffering. Today we usually use racked with followed by the word guilt. Racked with guilt, suffering from guilt. Racked with deep despair. And again, in religious terms, despair means having given up on the possibility of being forgiven by God. And him thus answered soon his bold compeer. Compeer on the right, it says comrade. In fact, you can understand this word. Look, peer. What is a peer? Tong Tai. Com means together. So come here is somebody on the same level together with him. Uh, and the editor explains that as a comrade. 同志, 同志. OK. And him thus answered soon his bold come here. Who is which is the subject of this sentence? say. Uh, OK, sorry, I should ask the other way. W who is the object? So to say. It's him, right? It has to be him. Him is the subject form of he, uh, the object form of he. Right, so him has to be the object. And so the only other noun must be the subject. His comrade, his compere. So the sentence is, and his bold compere soon answered him thus. Thus means in this way. And then below the new quotation is what the other devil says. So you really have to pay attention to the grammar. OK, and the new angel. Oh, Prince, he's talking about Satan. O oh, chief of many throned powers. Again, power means angel. 
that led them battled seraphim to war under thy conduct. Seraphim is another is a kind of angel. There are different kinds of angels in the Bible. If you look at the footnote, it says there were nine orders of angels arranged hierarchically, and then it gives you the name of the different kinds of angels. And then it says uh, the poem doesn't care about the different levels. It's just different names for angels. So it's kind of a useless note. It just means angel. Embattled. To be in the middle of battle. Uh, today in English, embattled means to be under attack. Uh, usually in a, at a in a metaphorical sense, to be using the to the so duofang gongji. Duofang pongji. So he's saying, Satan, you led us all to war under thy conduct, which means under your leadership. And in dreadful deeds, fearless, endangered heaven's perpetual king. So using dreadful means terrible. Terrible means striking terror. Terrifying. Uh, if you look at the word terrible, it ends with I-B-L-E, which means A-B-L-E. So capable of making terror. It's terrifying. Uh, so that's what dreadful means. Terrifying actions that are fearless. Uh, you manage to make heaven's eternal king feel danger, endangered. And put to proof his high supremacy. So God keeps saying, I am the ruler, and you put this statement to proof. You made him prove his claim to power. Uh, in English, we have a phrase, let's put it to the proof, which means let's like try, do an experiment. Let's prove that this is true. Let's put it to the test. Let's put it to the proof. Uh, and so put to proof. What is he going? What did Satan prove? Whether upheld by strength or chance or fate. So God is in power. How does he maintain his power? Is it because he's stronger? Is it because he's lucky or is it because of fate? OK, so fate. This is a very strange concept for a Christian poem. God is all powerful. He's not supposed to be able to be controlled by something called fate. And that's ancient Greece. Zeus is the most powerful God, but Zeus has to obey fate. God does not. So when these devils are talking about fate, they are already showing how like unchristian they are, how much they don't agree with God being in power. Line 134. Too well I see and rue the dire event. Rue means uh, regret. But regret does not mean that he wants to change it. Regret in Chinese here is yi han, bu si hou hui. Uh, event on the right, it says outcome. So he doesn't rue the war. He rues the fact that they lost the war. 135, that with sad overthrow and foul defeat hath lost us heaven. So like God sadly overthrew us and foul means like evil or, or like nasty, dirty, unfair. Uh, and so he's like expressing his anger at losing. And because we lost, we also lost heaven. Like we were kicked out of heaven. And all this mighty host, host means army. Sometimes we still use this word in English, but it we uh, the 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 appearance of the word host to mean army um, 
you can see in the word hostile. Yo uh, It's connected to this meaning. Uh, so all this mighty host in horrible destruction laid thus low. So by losing the war, the entire army of devils uh, was laid low, was made weak in horrible destruction. We still use this phrase in English to lay low or to be laid low. As far as God's and heavenly essences can perish. We uh, perish means uh, to be destroyed. Sorry, to die. Perish means to die. Of course, angels are immortal. Angels cannot die. Devils also cannot die. As you, I'm sure you can tell by now, devils are simply angels that go against God. So he's saying we have become as weak as we ever can. This, as, this is as weak and weak as we can be because we can't die. So like this line, as far as God's and heavenly essences can perish, a strict translation into Chinese would be something like uh, Does that help? So, something like that. Okay. For the mind and spirit remains invincible. Again, for means because. And vigor soon returns. Vigor means energy, like powerful energy. Soon returns. Though all our glory extinct and happy state here swallowed up in endless misery. So again, even though all of our glory has been extinguished, and our happy situation has here been swallowed up in endless suffering. So even though this is our situation, we still have our mind and our spirit, and we are slowly gathering strength. One forty three. But what if he our conqueror, God, whom I now of force, which means necessarily believe almighty, which means all powerful, since no less than such could have or powered such force as ours. So uh, this devil is saying, I only believe that God is all powerful because that is the only way that he could have defeated us. So what if God, 146, have left us this, our spirit and strength entire strongly to suffer and support our pains? What if God only left us this strong spirit and entire strong strength only so that we will suffer more? You can think about this, right? These devils are stuck in hell. So if they are weak, at least they can say, oh, God made us weak. We can't do anything about it. But if they are strong, they might think, look at how much strength we have. And yet still we cannot escape from hell. So it would make their suffering even worse. It's kind of like if it's just a regular week, you can say, oh, I'm too busy to study Paradise Lost. But if it's the tomb sweeping holiday, you suffer even more because you don't have things to do. You don't have to go to class, but you still have to study. OK. Uh, and support our pains that we may so suffice his vengeful ire. Suffice means satisfy, vengeful just mean, it's related to revenge. Ire means anger. Uh, so he did this. He made us. 
He left us our strength so that we will suffer more because he wants more revenge from us. Or do him mightier service as his thralls by right of war. So this is the second option, right? 143, he said, what if, right? What if God did this because he wants us to suffer more? Or what if God did this so that uh, we do him mightier service as his thralls by right of war, whatever his business be here in the heart of hell to work in fire? or do his errands in the gloomy deep. This is option two. To do service to him means to work for him. Thralls, line 149 at the end. A thrall is a slave by right of war. So again, in the classical tradition, if you lose a war and you get captured, you become the, the slave of the winner. Uh, and if you... If your family wants you back, they have to pay your master. It's called a war ransom. Uh, so by right of war, we lost, we have to work for him. Whatever his business be here in the heart of hell, no matter uh, why he wants us here in hell to work in this place, or that we have to do his work, his errands, his work in this place, Gloomy deep. Gloomy means dark in this dark and deep place. So the idea is what if God defeated us and he didn't like destroy us? He only threw us into hell. What if he did this because there's something he wants us to do here? What if whatever action that we take is actually helping God? Turns out that's true. It's exactly what's happening. And Milton is kind of like making a joke about this, like the devils thought of it and then they ignored this possibility. Uh, we can also notice from the, uh, these lines that hell is dark. We think of hell as like being on fire, right? Burning everywhere. And it's true, but it's a dark fire. There is no light in hell. So this devil is saying, but what if God is has these plans for us? What can it then avail, though yet we feel strength undiminished or eternal being to undergo eternal punishment? Avail. This is related to the word available. The technical meaning of the word available means to be open to use. Able, right? Uh, to allow. So avail means use. So what can it then avail means what use is it? Even though we feel our continuing strength, even though we are eternal and cannot die, but we have to suffer eternal punishment. So this devil is actually questioning Satan. Satan is saying, yeah, we lost, but we still have our willpower. We still have our strength. We still have our hatred. We can still take revenge. And this devil is saying, but what if that's what God wants? Or what if we can never escape hell and we have to suffer here forever? Page eight. 156. Where to? Okay. Let's talk about this word, where to. You guys know the word therefore, right? Therefore means uh, this is the result. Therefore is actually answering a question. And the question is wherefore, right? Wherefore is the question, therefore is the answer. So wherefore means why. Where to means to which. Uh, and this is the same logic for all of the where words. Where to is to which, where for is for which, where from is from which, when, uh, where as is as which. So where to means to which. To these words, with speedy words, Larchfiend replied. 
Arch fiend. Fiend means devil. Arch means the leader. So this is Satan. So when Satan heard these words, he very quickly replied. Fallen cherub. Cherub means angel. Fallen cherub. He's talking to the other guy. To be weak is miserable doing or suffering. So yes, to be weak is whatever you do, whatever you suffer is miserable. But of this be sure. The word order I'm sure you can guess is be sure of this. So there's one thing you can be sure of. To do ought good never will be our task. Ought means anything. So it will never be our task to do anything good. But ever to do ill our soul delight. We will only enjoy when we do something evil. Ill is the opposite of good. Uh, today, ill is sometimes also the opposite of well, right? Well means healthy, ill means sick. 161, as being the contrary to his high will whom we resist. Um, because whenever we do evil, it is exactly opposite of what God wants. And God is whom we resist. This is the guy that we are fighting against. If then his providence, okay, it's, this is a religious word. Providence means God's plan. And usually God's plan is good. Not usually, God's plan is always good. Even if it feels like God is making you suffer, the idea of providence means that your suffering is for some kind of purpose. God has a higher plan, has a better plan, and one part of that plan, one small part of that plan is for you to suffer. Sorry. Uh, so that's what providence means. So Satan is saying, if then God's plan out of our evil seek to bring forth good, our labor must be to pervert that end and out of good still to find means of evil. Oh, wow. Like Satan is really, really, he's really good at poetry. Um, so the idea is, if God tries to turn our evil into something good, then our job is to twist that plan and out of God's good to always find a way of doing evil. Uh, so let's grab some uh, vocabulary. Uh, pervert. Today, the common uh, version that we see is perverted, right? Bien tai. But pervert just means twist or distort. You know, true. End means goal, purpose. 165 still means always. And means means uh, to a way to find means means to find a way uh, to do evil. And then uh, one more th grammar I want to point out. One sixty three. The verb is seek. But the subject of this sentence is his providence. Providence is uncountable. So the verb should be seeks, right? So why is it seek and not seeks? Because this is again the subjunctive mood. The original form of the subjunctive mood is uh, the verb looks like its original state. Uh, so this is fitting the word if, right? If, so it's a subjunctive. Uh, and that's why it says seek and not seeks. Now, I said that these three lines are incredibly good because it does exactly what it says. Satan says, if God tries to turn our evil into something good, we have to twist that and turn his good into something evil. And look at what these lines do. 
out of evil bring forth good. We must pervert that end and out of good make evil. Right? It turns one into the other. Uh, evil into good and then good into evil. And then you have a, a parallelism end and means. So it's like really balanced, uh, these three lines. So, you know, Milton knows what he's doing. When he said he wanted to be a great English poet, he was not kidding. 166, which oft times, which means often, may succeed so as perhaps shall grieve him. Sorry, oft times doesn't mean often. It means maybe. Like perhaps. Um, no, 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 it does mean often. Sorry, often. So because we're always trying to turn good into evil and this will often succeed so as perhaps shall grieve him. And maybe some of those successes will make God sad, to put it bluntly. If I fail not, so if I don't make any mistake. On the right it says error. Error is the verb form of error. Error is the noun, error is the verb. Error is the noun, error is the verb. Uh, OK, Microsoft doesn't know what I'm talking about. OK. Um, so if I don't make any mistake and disturb his inmost counsels from their destined aim, disturb means to shift. Today, disturb means to like annoy, right? But disturb means to make a change, to to knock off track, to derail, to upset. Uh, upset today also means something different. The original meaning of upset is like to flip over or like to shake, to, to knock off. Right? If you look at the word upset, right? Up and set. Something has been set down and you flip it up, you knock it out. Uh, so that's what disturb means. So we will always work against God. Sometimes we will succeed. And if we, I don't make any mistake, maybe we can affect God's plans and change his plans and make it so that his plans don't always succeed. Uh, councils here just means plans. Inmost means the most intimate, which means the plans that he most cares about. 169. But see the angry victor hath recalled his ministers of vengeance and pursuit back to the gates of heaven. You know, so usually if you lose a battle, uh, the winners will keep chasing you until they capture you or they kill you or they grab your king, right? But here Satan is saying, look, God has called back his army back to the gates of heaven. Minister today is like a government official or somebody in a church. But minister originally means somebody who carries out an action. Think of the word administer. So minister is somebody who administers. So here minister of vengeance and pursuit means somebody who carries out God's vengeance and pursuit of the enemy. So like generals and soldiers, that kind of idea. So God has called them back to the gates of heaven. 171, the sulfurous hail shot after us in storm or blown hath laid the fiery surge. So the sulfurous hail is referring to God's weapons, the, the weapons of God's army that were shot after us as if it were a storm of hail. Hail is ice that falls from the sky. 
冰袍。So for Liu Huang, um, so it's comparing like the sulfur thrown by God's angels, comparing it to hail, and then comparing the attack to a storm. But now, or blown, so now that they have blown over, they have finished uh, flying over our heads, hath laid the fiery surge. So now it has all calmed down. That from the precipice of heaven received us falling. Precipice means the edge of a cliff. Xuan Yai. Uh, received us falling. So like we fell from the precipice of heaven. And the thunder winged with red lightning and impetuous rage. Impetuous in Chinese is Tao Chi de. The idea is like full of uh, annoyance and anger. Impetuous rage perhaps hath spent his shafts. Spent means exhausted. Hao jing de. Shaft is the unit of thunder. It's actually the unit of, of an arrow. Jian, gong jian de jian. The dan wei zi shaft. And so it is traditionally also the unit of thunderbolts. So the idea is the attack stopped once we fell off the cliff from heaven down to hell. And maybe God's army has used up all of its thunder. Uh, 176 continuing. And ceases now to bellow through the vast and boundless deep. Uh, and so now uh, the attack no longer rushes through the endless uh, space between heaven and hell. So like they, they are no longer attacking us. Bellow means to yell. So it's the sound of the attack. So the idea here is. God is no longer attacking us. Let us not slip the occasion. So let, let's not uh, give up this chance. In English today, we still say this. To slip the occasion means to give up this opportunity. Let us not slip the occasion, whether scorn or satiate fury yielded from our foe. No matter if uh, the reason we have this chance is because God doesn't care to keep fighting us or whether God's anger has been satisfied. Regardless of the reason, we shouldn't give up this chance. Uh, and then skipping a few lines to 209, the next section is talking about uh, Satan is chained on a burning lake, and yet at the same time, he is trying to persuade his army to get up and fight again. And the more he talks, the, wor the deeper the hole that he's digging himself. 啊，就他越讲，他的那个勇士的谴责就越严厉。Right, damnation. Um, and then skipping a few more lines, two twenty one is another part of Satan's speech. Uh, and then we get to book two, and we have another powerful devil giving a speech. And they're having a strategy meeting. They're thinking, how can we take revenge on God? Uh, and uh, somebody tells Satan that God has a plan to create this place called Earth. And there will be like a garden or something called Eden. And God will create something called a human. And that these will be his most beloved creatures. So what if we can destroy humans? That would be the way to take revenge on God. And I'll leave you to read the rest of this. Uh, so please finish um, book up to book five. Uh, so you can stop reading when you see book six. And we will talk about this more next week. And remember, you can always look at the discussion questions on Moodle to guide your reading.